just to, I'm just going to do a few plugs before I introduce you lot, and I'm, I'm not going to do very long bios of any of you, I'm afraid. I hope you're not offended by that. But just to reiterate, it's going to be John, Paula, Will, James, which handily is the order you appear in on my screen. Um, and, and I'm going to start broadcasting now to start letting people in, so just wait until you see. Okay. Actually, one other thing I should say, even though we're broadcasting, is we've tried and failed to find a way to let us go back to a green room so I can thank you in person once the audience has gone. So we'll just get cut off at the end and I'll have to just email you and thank you, I think, because oh, we can quite cold. figure out that tech. <laughs> danger with these things is I obsessively watch the counter at the bottom. I'm not quite sure while well, it's still changing when we should start. So I'll give it 30 seconds or so and then we'll kick off. It's less excuse to be late if you're just changing rooms. Right, I think we're going to make a start. Uh, welcome everyone to the next of our Isolation Insight events. Uh, we have a great panel to talk about public opinion uh, on this day of all days, which is the fourth anniversary of the referendum. One of the very few advantages of doing these things virtually rather than in person is I don't have to sit here and make some announcements about toilets and fire alarms. So in this time I would have used to talk about toilets and fire alarms, let me just alert you to several things happening on our website uh, at the moment. Firstly, if you have a look today, there's some very good pieces, one by David Gork, one by Lisa Nandy, and there'll be one coming up later on today by Matthew Elliott of Vote Leave. Uh, secondly, we've launched our series on long reads, the first of which is now on the site by Jonathan Porters, who looks at what's, happening, what's happened to immigration and immigration policy and attitudes towards immigration since the referendum. Thirdly, tomorrow morning, we're launching a big report on what Brexit means for manufacturing. So look out for that. And finally, I imagine most of you who have signed into this are interested in public opinion. If you go to the report section of our site, there is a really good piece of work by Katie Haywood and Ben Rosher uh, on some recent survey material about political attitudes in Northern Ireland. And that's really well worth looking at. Uh, turning to today's panel, uh, we could hardly have asked for better. We have four fantastic speakers. John Curtis from the University of Strathclyde, Paula Surridge from the University of Bristol, Will Jennings from the University of Southampton, and James Johnson, co-founder of JL Partners, who also ran polling in number 10 for Theresa May, and I imagine is hugely jealous of the amount of cash that seems to be going towards polling in this number 10, but we may be asking about that later on. They're going to speak in that order. So without further ado, John, over to you. Thank you very much. And then I'm just going to switch my screen, hopefully reasonably efficiently, um, so that you can, um, I'm sorry, I always get this bit wrong, um, can uh, see the slides that I am going to portray. Okay, so what I've been asked to do is to quickly look at how public opinion has evolved in the four years since uh, June uh, 2016. I guess it might just be worth starting by asking why we should ask this question, because I think there certainly is a widespread feeling out there, well, Brexit's happened, it's been done, uh, therefore what the public think, uh, in a sense, is no longer relevant. Well, on that, I think I would just simply make two points. The first, of course, is that at least three of us on this panel are, are, are academics. Uh, we're interested in answering academic questions. And I think certainly one of the questions that we will be asking in the longer run, not just political scientists, but also historians, 
is how effective was the Brexit process at implementing uh, public opinion? Um, and in particular, uh, how do we evaluate it as an exercise in direct democracy? Um, and you know, uh, that um, is an, was an important constitutional evolution and I suspect uh, our views about the uh, 2016 referendum will color our views about whether and how referendums should be held in future. So that's one reason. The other reason is less academic, um, is that you know, the truth is that um, the, the view that we form in response to that question could well be an important part of the narratives that may or may not be created uh, in the wake of Brexit as we go forward. Now, I simply remind you, that the referendum that was held in 1975 was meant to end the debate about our membership of the then common market. It did not do so. It didn't take very many years for the Labour Party to be campaigning on an election, uh, a platform that said we should leave. Uh, not long after that, we get the formation of UKIP um, and the rest, of course, is history. And uh, the extent to which or not we come to the conclusion that Brexit did or did not implement the majority view could well be an important part of the currency of political debate um, in future. So with, with those prefacing remarks, I'm just going to very simply go through what do we know about public opinion using, of, of course, an instrument, uh, our views about the adequacy of which we can debate, but frankly, it is what we've got. Um, so let me first of all uh, look at what was a relatively limited number of polls that were conducted um, once the referendum was held through to the end of uh, 2017. And what I'm showing you here is the average share of the vote for remain and leave in a hypothetical second referendum. Uh, according to this poll, it's just divided into four time periods, basically the second half of 2016, uh, the first half of 2017 until um, the election of June 2017, from the election afterwards through to August 2017 and then the end of 2017. At this point, the polls begin to become more numerous and I'll show you where we're at thereafter. So certainly in the immediate wake of uh, the 2016 referendum through to and including the general election of 2017, the polls on average were showing a small but narrow lead, uh, but clear lead for leave. And to that extent, at least, there was no particular reason, despite some speculation at the time, that regret was widespread. Uh, maybe the lead was a little narrower than it was in the, in the ballot boxes, but frankly, uh, nobody would want to push that argument too far. What, however, you will notice is that once the general election was held, and the then Prime Minister failed to get the overall majority that was intended to deliver her uh, vision of Brexit uh, in that election, public opinion shifted on balance very narrowly in the other direction. Thereafter, we can look at, and this is um, a rolling average of the last half dozen polls all the way through from basically the beginning of 2018 through to Brexit day at the end of January this year when the polls began to be much more numerous as the debate about whether or not there should be a second referendum really took off. The blue line is those who said they'd vote remain. The green line is those who said they would vote for leave. Um, and as you can see, with once we got certainly past the spring of 2018, we were consistently showing a small but consistent and little varying lead for Remain, and by the time we got to Brexit Day, even after the general election, we were still looking at Remain 53, leave 47. So on this evidence, at least as to how people would say it in answer to polls, it is not clear that by the time we had got to Brexit Day, the majority public opinion was still in favour of leaving. That said, clearly the one thing that was certainly uh, the case is that the country looked as divided on Brexit Day as it had done on June uh, 23rd, 2016. To this, we can also add another piece of evidence, which is YouGov's in hindsight question, um, which in a sense tells a very similar uh, uh, story. Note here, I've deliberately started the 
scale at uh, not at zero on the left hand side. But notice again the importance of the apparent importance of the 2017 general election. Until the 2017 general election, YouGov were finding what slightly more people saying that Brexit was right than was wrong, but thereafter was finding the opposite. And then indeed, on their measure, the proportion saying it was wrong, if anything, growing up rather more widely um, uh, during the course of 2019 and remaining pretty stable and not pretty markedly changing in the light of the result of the December 2019 general election. So in the light of that, you might be saying, well, OK, maybe regret wasn't in evidence in the immediate wake of the referendum, but maybe the site of Theresa May, uh, who was meant to be pursuing Brexit, uh, 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 people losing confidence in her ability to deliver uh, in the wake of her performance in the 2017 election campaign, this is where regret kicked in. Well, actually, the story is a little more complicated than this and certainly raises questions about the effectiveness of referendums as instruments of direct democracy, at least on a narrow uh, uh, vote. So this is taking the last half dozen polls that were done that ask people how they vote in a second referendum, um, broken where the views of those who voted remain and those who voted leave are tabulated separately. And as we have long and repeatedly said, the crucial thing about the Brexit debate uh, after 2016 is that very few people change their minds. On these half dozen polls, 88% of Remain voters so they do exactly the same thing, and so also with 85% of Leave voters. Some tendency for Leave voters perhaps to be slightly softer, but not dramatically so. The real action is, is and has long been evident of being on the right-hand side of this diagram, which are those people who did not vote in 2016. For uh, quite a considerable time, this group was showing a clear preference for remain over leave. In part, these are younger people, in part, they're people who were unable to vote in 2016, but they're by no means the predominant part of this group. And in fact, on, on data that I've been collecting regularly throughout the Brexit process as a, uh, 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 via UKIS, you can actually chart how the views of abstainers change. So this is from NatSense Mixed Mode Probability Panel. I've, I've done surveys at various opportunistic points in time. And as you can see, September 2016, February 2017, yes, remain uh, abstainers were slightly more likely to say they'd vote remain than to say they'd vote leave, but not dramatically so. Come to the first reading, the other side of the 2017 general election, and the abstainers are clearly beginning to move in a remain direction, and they remain uh, consistently in that direction. If anything, they become slightly more so thereafter. So the grip that so far as anybody has changed their minds, it's not been those people who participated in 2016 as much as those people who did not. This, however, still leaves us with one final question. We might still want to ask the question, well, OK, it, perhaps there is some doubt about whether or not on Brexit Day, uh, people, a majority of people at that point wanted to leave, but are they in any event accommodating themselves to the change? Uh, is it clear that actually now it's happened that the new status quo has become the majority view? And that again could be important in the future debate. Now, in part, we could uh, address this using you guys in hindsight question. It's a question we can keep on asking, uh, even though Brexit has now happened. And as you can see, there's some sign that perhaps the proportion who say it's wrong has narrowed a bit, although I will say the most recent one didn't show that. But this, this is the, uh, the average of the post-Brexit polls. So 45 uh, uh, wrong, 41 uh, right, as opposed to uh, uh, 47, uh, 41. So there's been apparently some narrowing, but not necessarily enough to get uh, rid of the majority. We can also look at some polling that's been done, though, as a result of coronavirus, probably nothing like as much as otherwise would have done. And I think one of the things historians may also say as they try to grapple with this question as to whether or not we accommodate ourselves to Brexit is why it is to, is to uh, regret the fact that we have not done very much polling in this period, but we've done some. It consists of two kinds. One on the left-hand side are a number of polls 
which have asked people still remain versus leave. They, on balance, tend to suggest maybe the lead has narrowed a bit, but not necessarily by very much. So 53.47 becomes 52.48. On the other hand, BMG in particular um, have been asking a new question, which is whether we should rejoin or should we stay out? La a last, the last published reading on this is in April, so we don't know how stable this is. But perhaps not surprisingly, if we ask that question, we do, do then get a narrow majority saying that we should stay out. So um, to conclude, um, very, as David Cork has reiterated in his piece this morning, very few of us changed our minds despite the intensity of the Brexit debate in the last four years. But if we did change our point of minds at any point, the 2017 election was not only pivotal in the history of Brexit in terms of Parliament, it looks as though it was also pivotal so far as the balance of public opinion was concerned, and particularly primarily because it seems to have in, uh, helped to instigate a shift of attitudes amongst those who did not vote back in 2016, thereby raising doubts about whether or not there was a majority in favour. Um, had that said, we might be accommodating ourselves to the change a bit, but not that much. And certainly at this point, one has to say that Brexit divides this country just as much as it did four years ago today. John, thank you. And I should just flag up in the questions. I hope you people can see the written questions that come in. There's a question from Priyanka Kandapa about demographic change that you might want to look at for when we get to questions. Can I just say to the audience, uh, I was so busy doing cheap plugs for our website, I forgot to say this at the start. Uh, we're doing questions via the Q&A function at the bottom. So if you have questions, if you write them in there, and submit them and then we'd ask you all if you could I know it's a bit tacky and populist but it works quite well actually uh, to vote you can like or you can like other people's questions and basically the ones with most likes get sorted towards the top so I'll try and do it in that way we've also got a whole pile of questions that have been submitted prior to the event and I'll try and get through some of those as well but do keep your questions coming in and do vote for questions as I see you're now doing that's very obliging of you. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll get to questions soon. We'll have an hour for questions, I hope. We're going till half past one. Sorry about that, Paula. Over to you. Thank you. I'll also do the kind of not very efficient screen sharing. Hopefully that's working. <laughs> So the period since the referendum has been particularly strange for me because I've been asked to talk about things that I was talking about a lot before the referendum, but nobody was listening. Um, and hopefully what I'm going to show you will explain, um, explain why that was the case. So I'm going to talk about the relationship between political values and voting behaviour and how that's changed since 2015. Um, and I want to just begin. All right, I've now not worked out how to change my slide sorry happily looking at it in zoom instead of on the actual screen come on there we go um before i go into talking about positions of parties and types of voters and so on i thought it would be useful just to flag up the measures that are being used um, because i think this actually matters much much more um than those people using these measures, myself included, have, have interrogated enough. So two sets of measures, one that measures economic left-right values, and you can see the five measures there. Um, the thing I would most want to highlight on that scale is that if you look through those measures, there's nothing there specifically about attitudes to welfare. Um, and that becomes quite important in, in thinking about how um, parties might respond to these to these value divides and then I've stuck with the label liberal authoritarian for this uh, somebody will shout at me about it at some point during the questions and answers I'm sure um, but I think it better captures what this set of measures is getting at and here I want to point out that it doesn't include anything specifically about attitudes to immigration 
nothing about gay marriage or any of the many other kind of single issue flashpoints that people tend to hook onto when I start to talk about this value dimension. And absolutely critically, there is nothing in that value dimension as measured by those as measured by those five items that in any way directly relates to the EU. Um, I can make these slides available afterwards in case I'm going through a little bit too fast. So I want to start off in 2015. And here I've plotted on a two dimensional space, the position, the average position of voters for Labour and the Conservatives, uh, broken down by how those voters went on to vote in the referendum. We're still in 2015 here. Notice that I have um, truncated both of the axes because actually otherwise everybody gets squashed into the same little part of this of this um, space. So you're seeing um, scales that actually run from zero to 10, but I've truncated the economic left right to run from zero to six because that captures everybody. And for, to try and keep it symmetric, I've also done a similar length of scale, but the other end from four to 10 on the um, liberal authoritarian scale. And what I really want to highlight here is that the divides that we've seen drive our politics over the last four years predate the referendum. So Labour Remain voters were different from Labour Leave voters in 2015. Okay, and similarly with Conservative Leave and Conservative Remain voters. Two other features of this particular data. First of all, there isn't much difference between leave and remain voters on either side in terms of their economic position. There are slight differences. And um, I'm sure to the, um, again, to the, to the argument of the remain side, I don't think they'll necessarily agree, but the voters within the Labour Party and the voters within the Conservative Party that went on to vote leave were slightly more left wing in each case than those that went on to vote remain. And that often gets lost um, in this debate. But the much, much bigger divide is on that social liberal, social authoritarian scale. There's a much wider divide between the Labour Remain voters and the Labour Leave voters than there is between the Conservative Remain voters and the Conservative Leave voters. And that's partly what then feeds into the difficulties that this causes the Labour Party after the referendum right up to the 2019 general election. So oddly enough, a, a referendum that was supposed to heal divisions in the Conservative Party actually revealed divisions in the Labour Party, at least at the level of their voters. So I want to then use the same framework, the same set of scales to look at how the average positions of voters for the two parties have changed over this period. So we've got Conservative voting in 15, 17, 19 and likewise for Labour. You can see here that two processes have been happening at the same time. The Labour vote has been, been becoming, um, I'd say gradually, but actually that's quite rapidly more liberal um, across those three elections, whilst the Conservative vote has been moving more dramatically on the left-right axis. So we end up at the 2019 election with a position where the difference between the two parties is about equal on these two dimensions, whereas in 2015, the difference was slightly greater on the left-right dimension. I sometimes think of it, I can't, I can't, quite, I can't quite show you with my hands in, in this format, but I sometimes think of it as like we had a box where the voters were positioned and we kind of squashed it and turned it more into a, more into a parallelogram and pushed the, the, them together and apart in different directions. I know some people will want to, to know um, what the other parties look like. And I apologize in advance because when I add them on, this chart does become very messy because you've got a lot of parties moving um, around this space. But although it becomes very messy, it also really highlights how the Conservatives were able to do what they did in 2019. Because you can see that the Conservative vote is out there on its own. There are no parties really very close in terms of the average position of their voters to the Conservative Party. Um, they stand out on their own in terms of the economic dimension in particular. They also stand out on their own in terms of the 
um, liberal authoritarian dimension, if we take the Brexit party and, and UKIP before that, I've used these as equivalent in this chart, um, out of the equation, which of course is exactly what happened in 2019 in a whole range um, of constituencies. You can see the part at the bottom there, um, the SNP vote largely occupies exactly the same position as the Labour vote, um, which partly explains some of the difficulties that Labour have in Scotland, not wholly by a long way. Um, we can also see, though, that the other parties, the Greens and the Lib Dems, have become over time, um, the voters for those parties have over time become more and more in the center of that economic left-right dimension because Labour have been losing voters not only off the top, not only their more authoritarian voters, but they've also been losing those voters that were slightly to the um, right, not hugely to the right, but slightly to the right, have also been peeling off from the party. So we see that movement. So then I want to just bring us up to date with this story um, of the leave remain split and whether it's going to go away, whether it's going to remain important. The result of the leave remain split has been that the Conservative Party have gained voters that were to the left of them in 2015, but that were really not very different from them in terms of their social values on this liberal authoritarian scale. So as a result, what we see in the Conservative Party now is that there's a bigger split really between their voters on left-right values than on the um, liberal authoritarian values. So if the Conservative coalition is going to pull apart, um, it's more likely to be along economic issues. Um, and that will be before the, the current crisis hit, the talk of levelling up and some of the things that were coming out of, out of that very much focused on trying to keep that coalition together. And there are all sorts of challenges, I think, up ahead for the Conservative Party in terms of how they continue to keep that coalition together. And it, it puzzles me why, looking at that data, you would have a two-day argument about free school meals, but that's someone else to, um, to think about. On the Labour side, the difference between their Remain and their Leave voters is still very large in terms of the, the social liberal authoritarian issues. There are still some Labour Leave voters and they are still distinct from the Labour Remain vote on that dimension. And that is going to continue to cause difficulties for the party in how they can talk to both sides of that debate. They are also, however, close together still and always have been in terms of economic issues. Um, I think the party are partly misdiagnosing some of their issues by saying everything's fine in terms of economic policy, but in terms of uniting their vote, issues on economics are far more likely to do that than issues on the social um, divide. And I think that's all. Lovely, thanks ever so much, Paul. I'd completely missed that fact that uh, the Leave voters were slightly to the left for both parties in one of your earlier slides. That was fascinating. Uh, do keep uh, sending your questions in and do keep making my job easier by voting for questions, please, because then we'll get some filtering going on. In the meantime, Will, over to you if you're ready. Okay, absolutely. Let's uh, let's see how it goes. Here we go. Let me just uh, kind of see that. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah. Is that okay? I will. Um, I will uh, f uh, fly through at um, a high pace so I can get this thing working. There we go. Um, so I want to really talk um, about about the issue of political trust and how Brexit and a little bit about how COVID have really political trust upside down. Um, I apologise in advance, and I'm going to show you lots of graphs and uh, figures just to show you a bit of survey data. Um, but I have tweeted most of it out. So if we, with anything you kind of pause upon, uh, just uh, have a look at my Twitter feed, and you'll see most of the graphs. Um, I want to talk about three things. Um, first, I just want to give a bit of background about um, political distrust and the referendum vote, where we started. Um, second, I want to talk about trends in political trust. Uh, and thirdly, um, since 2016, over the past four years. And finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about where we are and whether we might be entering a new era of political trust, uh, how much uh, Brexit has really turned our political world upside 
down. Um, so um, a, a, a commentator who is no, normally wrong on these issues, uh, writing in The Guardian on the 4th of June uh, 2016, said that evidence uh, shows rising levels of political disaffection in Britain and rejection of the political and economic establishment is arguably one of the reasons that overwhelming economic arguments for staying in the EU have, haven't yet delivered a knockout blow. Distrust of politics and dissatisfaction with British democracy as strong predictors of Euro Euroscepticism. The tailwinds of anti-politics are behind the campaign for Brexit. And remarkably, given my re uh, record of forecasting over the last four years, that was me uh, saying that political trust might be important. Um, and I think that really has proved to be the case um, over the last four years. Just to give you a sense of how political trust was div divided between Remain voters and Leave voters, in 2016, um, the British Social Attitudes Survey asks a question about whether people trust British government to place the needs of the nation above the interests of their own political party. And in 2016, the number of Leave voters saying that they uh, almost never would place the needs of the nation above the interests of their own party was 33% compared to 20% for Remain voters. So Leave voters were at the time highly cynical about politics. They also were more likely to give a response to the question, politicians don't care what people like me think in the British election study in 2016. That's a, a five point scale um, uh, from, uh, where um, five is strongly agree. So they're more likely to agree with that proposition. And whereas Remainers in 2016, the British election study were more likely to express higher levels of trust in MPs. So we had this, we had the vote and it kind of reflected this, uh, the higher levels of distrust in the political establishment, the political elite among Leave voters. Well, what's, well, what's happened since? I think actually political trust tells a really um, uh, interesting uh, story about the, the last four years. And it actually tells us that I think voters really follow politics. Um, over, over the period between 2014 actually and um, uh, May to June 2017, in the run up to the, the general election, Political trust kind of bumped along a little bit. There were little kind of fluctuations, but nothing really remarkable. Um, and, and the time, and just a warning that the time on the um, x-axis is not evenly spread. It's between different waves of the uh, British election study. But we see that period between December 2016 and, um, sorry, June 2017, uh, in the, in the, during the, um, the kind of what the, the period around the general election and March 2019, a real collapse in political trust of the sort we haven't really seen as the Brexit process really hit, hit the skids and the government got in real trouble with its planning uh, and, and Parliament um, stood in the way. And so actually, you know, it was actually quite a rational response of voters in this period to becoming just distrusting of MPs who they saw were potentially standing in the way of Brexit or at least becoming frustrated that this process wasn't going on. But that headline figure really um, disguises what was going on among, among this under the surface. If you look at the trend for Leave voters and Remain voters over this period, I mean, it's first of all, as we saw it in the 2016 data, data Leave voters were less trusting of um, MPs in general over this period. But actually, in the in the period after the referendum, they kind of closed the gap. So by by the election of 2017. Um, uh, Leave voters were as likely to say they had uh, trust in MPs as, re as Remain voters, still at not very high levels, but nevertheless. But in, in the period where Brexit seemed like it was falling apart, trust of Leave has collapsed again. But it's really notable in the last year how Leave voters not only have become more trusting again, as they have seen uh, Brexit delivered, uh, a government that is kind of is uh, given much greater emphasis to, well, uh, I suppose it was unfair to say that May of didn't, didn't give emphasis to delivering Brexit, but to see Brexit break through the logjam in Parliament, whereas Remain voters um, slightly kind of rose in, in trust over the period in the run-up to election, but have fallen away since. And so we've actually seen a realignment of political trust where the group who are most likely before the referendum, say they had lower trust in, in, in politics and MPs, are now more trusting in politics. And we've seen a similar thing with satisfaction with democracy, that in the period um, uh, following the, the general election in, in December 2019, Leave voters are now more satisfied with UK, UK democracy by a really substantial um, uh, margin. So we have really seen a real kind of turnaround in how Leavers um, and Remainers see politics. I wanted to say just briefly about the, the general election, because I'm slightly prompted on me this, about the extent to which trusting uh, the Boris Johnson to get Brexit done might have uh, influenced things. Oops, sorry. Um, 
And we see that conservative voters in 2019 from the British election study were much more likely to think that the UK government in December 2019 was handling the process of leaving the EU well, whereas Labour voters weren't. It really seems to have figured in, in the way, in the, in the, in the, obviously, in, in, in the vote in the general election. And we see similar sorts of um, uh, uh, patterns in perceived competence of Boris Johnson and uh, Jeremy Corbyn, that the competence and the, the trust being trusted to deliver among Johnson was much higher. His ratings and competence were much higher among conservative voters, whereas Corbyn had much lower competent, competence um, ratings in general. So let me just talk finally about kind of some recent survey uh, work that we've, the, the, the ESSC project I'm working on has done with Ips, Ipsos Mori that really points to how political trust has been, re been realigned in 2020. We asked um, uh, respondents a series of questions uh, about um, different aspects of political trust. And we've seen now a complete realignment of levels of trust between Leavers and Remainers. Leavers are now more likely to say that they trust the UK government to take care of its citizens. Uh, this survey was conducted in, in May 2020 in the, in the height of the, of the pandemic. Leavers are now more likely to say that in general, the government usually does the right thing. Um, they're also more likely to say the government understands the needs of my community. Um, compared to Remain voters. Um, in contrast, we've seen that Remainers, the traditional high trusters of uh, British politics over the last decade, are now think it's more, it's best to be cautious about trusting the government. Um, they also think um, that, inf that they're more likely to agree that information provided by the government is generally unreliable. The, 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 the Remainers are now kind of more skeptical and distrustful of, of British government than, than Leavers. Um, and, and just to, come to close, what, what's interesting then is how um, uh, feelings of political distrust might be being displaced in British politics today. Leave voters um, still express higher levels of distrust in media. Um, they're more likely to believe that the media have exaggerated the extent of the coronavirus outbreak. And so while we might have seen a kind of realignment of political trust, it may be that some of our kind of conflicts around social political trust are moving to other forums. But just to kind of caution against being kind of going, going too far on that point, it's really important to say that despite varying levels of political trust and, and trust in media, the, there's very little difference in how people perceive the threat of COVID, either to them personally or to the country. And so while we see these kind of the, this realignment of political trust, people are still responding to, to real objective conditions and changes in performance of uh, government. And so I've taken here um, the uh, opinion um, uh, regular tracker of approval of the government's handling of the coronavirus situation. And while it's obviously true that Leavers have much, expressed much higher levels of approval. What's really striking from this rally around the flag that the government enjoyed in the early part of the crisis and has, and, and has since declined is that those two groups are moving together. And so although we have seen a realignment, um, the satisfaction of leavers and remainers um, with the government during the COVID crisis is moving in parallel and in, in parallel publics. And so to, cl to close, um, I think there's been a lot of talk about um, polarization in British politics, but I, I think with, with regard to political trust, it's not so much the political trust is polarized, but the winners and losers of political British politics have changed sides. And those parallel publics we see in, in approval of the government handling of COVID suggest the public are still updating evaluations of trustworthiness. Their response to the Brexit negotiations and the kind of the, the fluctuations we saw in political trust there really reflected how people were seeing what people were seeing in Parliament and how the government was getting Brexit through. And so as we look to a new era of political trust, we might ask how long, how long this kind of new status quo might last. You know, at what point what might the kind of the losers and the winners shift around again? Um, uh, uh, colleagues on the British election study, Jane Green and others have talked about the importance of political shocks. And we might start asking, what is the next series of political shocks that might um, shift us out of this post-Brexit alignment? Of political trust. Uh, and the final thing just to say in terms of the UK and the Changing Europe program is we've been conducting focus groups that were still halfway uh, through the process of in among leavers and remainers. And what's really striking is, is both that the leavers have a kind of nervous trust about Brexit. They understand um, the kind of the complexities of delivering Brexit in the context of, of COVID. 
Uh, and actually, it's interesting in the context of talk of polarization is that while Remainers lack trust, they're often fatalistic about the Brexit process. There doesn't seem to be in the focus groups we've run, at least, a great willingness or a kind of keenness to rerun the debates of the last four years. Um, and so political trust, while we might see this realignment, doesn't necessarily suggest that people want to refight um, the political battles of the past. Thank you, Will. Excellent plug for UK and a changing Europe. We'll invite you back. Uh, can I just keep nagging the audience slightly? I mean, your questions for later speakers are getting fewer likes, uh, and that might be because you like them less. It might be because you've had less time to find them. But if you can keep just if you can keep liking things, so I have a sense of which the most popular questions are, that would be great. James, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, and unlike the others, I've been totally shown up by not actually having any slides. So uh, you're going to have to look at my uh, look at my face, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, polling and focus groups, quite a lot, a lot more focus groups uh, than polling that my firm's been doing. Um, and I've also been doing through with a couple of other firms as well. Um, but I want to sort of think about what comes next, and particularly for these voters uh, who were so decisive in December in the, in the red wall, um, and the sort of Lee voters that, um, that, that John, Paula and Will have been, have been talking about. And as we do so, I want to drag us back in time to uh, March 2018. Um, uh, and uh, on that, in that month, I spent uh, two days uh, doing very large focus groups um, while I was still working at Number 10 uh, in Birmingham. And uh, um, it was that freezing cold breeze uh, from the east winter, and we had about 40 people in the room um, and uh, we had different people from different political tribes, uh, but one table sort of um, full of uh, uh, people who would go on to become um, the voters so decisive uh, in the Red Wall uh, in December. And one of them uh, I remember very well. He was the sort of quite large uh, chap, um, and uh, he had this he was a scaffold. And he had a fantastic tattoo on his arm, which said, James, can I, just, can I just butt in yep. You're breaking up slightly. It might ah. be worth you just turning the camera off and trying. You're getting a bit distorted. It's quite hard to follow. Fair enough. Let me just quickly... Nothing to do with your face, I promise. Nope. Okay. Let me know if it happens again, because there's something else I can turn off. Uh, sorry yeah, about that. That's fair. Great. Um, so, yes, uh, in this in this focus group uh, in Birmingham in March, um, there was a chap uh, who was a scaffolder, manual worker, um, he, he, in many ways, he was the uh, title uh, voter that was to come. Uh, he had this fantastic tattoo on his arm that said Bulldog Breed um, with a great uh, British flag uh, emblazoned across it. He voted for Corbyn in 2017, um, but at that point he was going to vote Conservative. We don't quite know what's happened to him, but I expect that uh, he did end up voting Conservative in December um, as well. Um, and uh, his his views uh, tell us quite a lot about where these Red Bull, Red, Red Bull voters are and where they uh, might go uh, next. Um, and actually, I'll just show some of our simple things about these voters as well. And I think the first thing to say about them... James, um, it's and I'm just, there's still a bit of an issue. Uh, I don't know if... There's... Okay, give me one second. Give me one second. In our house, that would be me pulling the PlayStation out of the wall. Okay, we could try once more. Sorry about that. No, that sounds sounds so far so good. Sorry about this. That's okay. No, no, it's probably my fault. Um, it has been working fine, but uh, let me try. Let me try again. Um, so the key thing about these voters um, is this uh, sense of fairness, um, which really pervades. Uh, everything um, that they think about. Um, it explains why they voted leave um, and it explains their views on other things, some of the issues uh, that all of uh, us touched on in her presentation. Um, and I think it's really important to realise that this didn't start with Brexit for these voters. Um, you know, they've had these views for a long time and they had this frustration um, that uh, they um, have worked hard day in, day out. Um, you know, they, they, they put in, they work nine to five, they do long hours, um, and they don't always feel like their work and their hard work is being rewarded. And you see this time and time again in focus groups, this frustration um, that, uh, that they seem to be putting in lots of effort and not getting rewarded, where other people seem to. And they talk about these others um, an awful lot, uh, whether it's... Um, uh, benefit claimants who they feel haven't uh, worked hard enough, 
uh, but are still getting state support, whether it's um, low skilled immigration, um, who they feel uh, um, sort of get better benefits than they do, um, or whether it's tax dodgers and big business um, who they're frustrated by. Um, so this really pervades a lot of their feelings. And I think it's really important that this culture is based on that, because yes, it, yes, that feeling, that frustration helps explain why people voted leave in 2016, but it also helps explain why people voted UKIP in 2015 and why people voted Conservative in December 19 as well. So even if it goes away, that feeling, that frustration is not going anywhere. Um, a couple of other points on that. Um, immigration, I mentioned there, um, we have seen across a number of uh, metrics, um, uh, including um, uh, some of those, uh, the Ipsos Mori tracker and others, showing that attitudes towards immigration have got more positive um, and that, uh, and that um, frustration, uh, concern about immigration has gone down overall. But we also know from the British election study that immigration was an absolutely key reason for many of those voters uh, uh, opting for leave in 2016. And again, when you go to those groups in these areas, when you go to Darlington, when you go to Wakefield, uh, when you go to Torrington, uh, South, um, or wherever it might be, uh, it still comes up and it comes up very strongly indeed, especially around the frustration about low skilled immigration, uh, impact on public services, impact on community. Now, whether that's right or wrong, Perception is reality. That exists. People are, people still think that. And that is a really important thing for politicians to take seriously. It was flagged by the 16 referendum and it will continue to be important when speaking to those voters. But I just want to touch on Brexit itself um, because, uh, yes, obviously, these voters, Paul Dobreed in the uh, Birmingham um, uh, focus group, he voted leave. He wanted his vote respected. He probably wanted, as I say, some form of immigration control. Um, and all of that sort of does tally with our sort of standard view of, of, of these uh, Red Bull voters. But I want to a bit of a myth on this because these voters aren't as predictable as you might think. And sometimes they are a bit unfairly categorized, uh, characterized by the Twitter um, and uh, Twitter bubble and the commentariat, and indeed sometimes by the Conservative Party itself. I think the key thing that I found in, in hundreds of focus groups, both while I was at number 10 and since, is that these guys aren't really Brexit culture warriors. They don't actually mean much about the ins and outs of Brexit. Um, they're not sort of you know, uh, keeping up to date with every last twist and turn. They're not uh, the people who go out in, uh, who went out in Westminster all through 2019, um, you know, sort of uh, protesting. Brexit. They're quite normal people who are, uh, yes, they were frustrated by the process. Yes, they want their vote to be respected, but they're not completely incensed and motivated uh, and uh, uh, brought to anger about it, uh, perhaps as some of the uh, some of the um, uh, more prominent uh, voices might be to leave. And that's backed up in some of the data as well. So in the Ipsos Mori tracking issues index, you've seen Brexit decline. You saw that decline, uh, yes, because of coronavirus, but also just before after the 31st of January deadline as well. And in polling that I've done, the number one priority after the general election for these red wall voters um, is not Brexit, it's the NHS, um, and also uh, cost of living as well. So there's this growing sense that, you know, amongst these voters that, you know, once sort of Brexit is done in their minds, and for many that was January the 31st, or even the election on December 12th, it's gonna be less uh, cr uh, critical to their, to their vote. Um, so, you know, yes, they're not changing their minds on Brexit. And I think, you know, John's polling clearly shows that, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they're not sort of changing their position. Um, they may well be much more interested in other things. And we've seen that in some other metrics as well, um, you know, on, in terms of support for an extension, much more fluid than before. Um, you know, before, before uh, uh, number 10 hardened their position on extension, we actually saw in some polls a plurality of Leave voters saying that they were quite happy with an extension to the transition period if that was due to coronavirus. And even when I was running the poll in the uh, after the uh, uh, ill-fated checkers summit um, in July of 2018. James, you just James. want to pause just for a sec because you were, it was getting, it, it's sort of coming and going, but if you put, if you, when you restart, it gets better. If you could just do the sort of last tiny bit and start again, it might be clearer. Yeah. Um, 
so uh, yeah, I was just saying there that um, you can see this sort of fluidity um, in some of the in some of the polling um, when it's on an extension period um, and whether it's on the, the nature of the deal. I think in going back to that ill fate to checkers summit, um, we saw that uh, um, views uh, immediately after that checkers summit on the Sunday after in the polling was actually on balance positively or not. It was only after Boris Johnson and DD resigned that those polls must have turned and the elite views set, set the agenda. So leave them to a little bit more fluid, perhaps, than some have given them credit for. And the final thing I'll tell that is that we're not in, uh, just to back up this fact, this point, that we're not in this sort of Brexit culture war. I saw last night that uh, Dominic Cummings had uh, referred to Keir Starmer as a Remainer lawyer. Um, and you can see some of this language in Boris Johnson's PMQ's uh, uh, performances as well. And I saw a tweet by uh, George uh, Eaton from the New Statesman saying, you know, it feels a bit like number 10 are fighting the last war on this. Uh, now, actually, I don't think either of those things are right. Because the last war, the reason the Conservatives won so well in Dece on December 12th was not because of a Brexit culture war. It was because of a Brexit boredom war. It was just because everybody was so bored of the thing, so desperate to get the thing done, um, that they managed to appeal to that. Now, clearly, they did, they did better amongst Leave voters. Clearly, for many of those voters who were with them, it was about respecting the result of the referendum. But certainly, in my experience of doing focus groups around that, around that election, yes, it mattered more if you voted Leave. Of course it did. But messages around you know, people versus parliament, or you know, smearing people as Remainers had much less effectiveness with voters than just saying, let's try and get the thing done. And we saw that pivot with Number 10's messaging throughout 2019. You know, in sort of uh, September, October, um, they were very focused on this more sort of Brexit culture war uh, uh, messaging. And by the, um, by the sort of um, Tory party conference and into the election itself, we saw the public opinion search having impact and the message changed to get Brexit done and this sort of desire to put things to one side. So look, I think to sort of start to wrap up, I think you know, what we are seeing is that there is this, uh, um, yes, Brexit really obviously does matter to these voters, but it's really their values underneath that that matters the most. And uh, there may just be a risk for number 10 uh, for trying to turn this into uh, another Brexit culture war. There may just be a backlash to that. There may just be, a little bit more Brexit consensus out there uh, than, than, than we think. And I think just the last point on that, if you can, if you can still hear me, if my signal has, has held yeah. long enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the moment. <laughs> very good. Um, is uh, that also applies to a general culture war as well. Now, you know, thinking back to our bulldog breed uh, uh, voter from, from Birmingham, you know, clearly he is gonna be on the more socially conservative side of the divide that Paula spoke about. He is more likely to be on the, uh, you know, pro keeping statues up um, and, you know, less likely to want to uh, uh, engage in some of these, um, uh, less likely to agree with some of these uh, cultural, cultural arguments that are being made. But again, people hoping to capitalize that on that, potentially number 10, might be disappointed. Although they do hold those cultural views, they simply have bigger priorities around the NAS, around the cost of living, um, and around immigration. So there is a trap for Labour that the Conservatives are setting, because as, Paula, as Paula's research shows, you know, there are those Labour voters who are more socially conservative that could yet be uh, captured by the Conservatives. But if Labour doesn't fall for the trap, and it looks like Keir Starmer isn't doing that, uh, then actually those voters may well care more about some of those bigger scale things. So look, just to finish, um, Clearly, these red wall voters, they are the key to the future. Um, they, are, they are the most important. You ignore them at your peril as a political party. Um, you know, the, that, whether that majority of 80 is taken away at the next election very much depends on these voters that came to our attention because of 2016. Yes, Brexit is important, but it goes beyond that. It's about that fairness feeling. And Keir Starmer, if he, if he focuses on those wider issues, he doesn't fall for those traps then he could well speak to them. And I think there are some very small danger signs already for the Conservatives on that. So in my polling uh, in January, 
37% thought Labour was the most out of touch party, 25% the Conservatives. Now, that's 33% saying the Conservatives are the most out of touch, and 17% Labour. It's more saying the Tories are out of touch, where it was the other way around in January. So is that 17, this is James? 17, yeah. Okay. So this is where the fight now comes in on fairness, on who stands up for me. Because this bulldog breed voter is actually a lot more complicated than we think. And he might not be won over by culture wars. He might not be run won over by a re reheated Brexit debate. He'll be won over by who he feels stands up, for mo stands up the most for him uh, from the political class. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, James. You want to, I mean, you can put your camera back on if you want. I'm not sure it made all that much difference. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I think uh, I detected at least two Curtis head shakes. So we're going to have a good debate going forward, I think. Uh, and we might ask Will what he thinks of the term culture war at some point, because uh, I did notice a I tweet. I Curtis head shake for that, if you like. <laughs> we'll get on. I, I feel honour bound to start with... Uh, Priyanka Kandapa's question, just because, I mean, she's won. And Priyanka, if you ever come to one of our events, we'll give you a mug uh, in recognition of the fact that you're the clear winner. And the question, I think, is to you, John, basically, which is about, if anyone else wants to chime in, they can, the degree to which these shifts, these albeit small shifts that we've seen, are down to demographic change rather than anything else. That's to say, people who couldn't vote in 2016 are now being asked because they're 18. You're on mute, John. It's part of the story, but it's only a probably relatively minor part of the story. Um, if it were true that we were simply looking at the consequences of uh, demographic change, then I should have shown you in the slides a gradual secular increase in support for Remain and a gradual secular decline in support for Leave. That is not what I showed you. What I showed you was a moment in time, which, which is a relatively short period of time, immediate wake of the 2017 general election, when opinion shifted and particular shifted amongst that group of voters who abstained. Um, the other thing I can say, it's a while since I've worked this out, but um, uh, a very large poll that Salvation did, what, probably a year out from Brexit, you had to get to age 35 before you got as many as half of those who had not voted in 2016. So uh, the point is, it's, it's a lot of people who are, were 18 in uh, 2016. There will be disproportionately younger people, um, but even though they could have voted, they didn't. So the demographic profile is, you know, that, that much is going on. Um, but um, it, 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 the timing uh, is such and the scale is such that it's not an adequate explanation. I could also bore you with a technical explanation about the fact that the data I showed you from the NatSem panel over time, because the NatSem panel is recruited from a survey uh, conducted sometimes two or three years earlier of people who had to be 18 by that point, if anything, it probably underestimates the number of abstain uh, of uh, new people uh, in the sample, but even so, you've, I, I've shown you how their attitude shifted. Does anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, just wave or butt in or whatever. I mean, I'm going to intersperse questions from the Q&A with ones that came in earlier, but I'll go to the second one from Roland Scarlett, which is, I suppose, the question we're all asking ourselves is, once Brexit is, is clearly done, we can argue about whether it's done now, or whether it'll be done at the end of the year, but do we move on? I suppose partly that's you, Paul. I mean, it's all of you in a sense, uh, goes to what James was saying as well. Uh, does that division just disappear and we go back to argue about the things we used to argue about or does Brexit linger on? I'll let Paula go first, John, then come to you if that's okay. If you want to, Paula. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it goes away. Um, because I don't think it was created by Brexit in the first place. So the idea that we take away the thing that accelerated it um, doesn't, doesn't stop the divide being there. You know, rather like if you throw petrol on a fire, you take the petrol away, the fire's still raging. So I think the divide is a long-term divide that was given a push of salience around Brexit. So it brought it up into all our discussions. And I've described it before as a kind of wound that we just kept just kept picking at and made it worse and worse and worse. But I don't think it's going to go away just because people perceive that Brexit is done. Um, I think it will just be 
um, maybe transferred onto other issues or maybe um, continue to be an identity that the media point to and therefore keep again a bit like continuing to pick at the wound keeps keeps the salience great john you wanted to come in um well it, this really says expands on some of what james was saying in his remarks um we clearly have just had an issue that has completely dominated our politics completely uh, thrown a brexit off the agenda and which is very, very clearly a valence issue rather than a position issue, and that is handling the coronavirus. And if you actually look at the dynamics of um, support for the Conservative Labour parties from April, when the Conservatives were at their very height in the polls with around 50% support, and look where they are now with uh, down to 43 and Labour up to 37, what you discover is the decline in Conservative support in the last three months has occurred equally amongst Remain and Leave voters. The increase in Labour support has occurred in increasingly amongst Remain and Leave voters, from which two points flow. The point is other issues may come along and they will create a dynamic that can well change the position of the parties, could well, if they were to continue, be sufficient to enable the Labour Party, certainly to deny the Conservatives an overall majority, but without actually disturbing the underlying structure, which is still there. It is still the case even today, although the Conservatives have lost support amongst Leave voters, they are still uh, more than three times more popular amongst Leave voters than they are amongst Remain voters. So the structure could still be there, but a crucial thing to realize is that the dynamics of party support, and particularly if dynamics of party support are caused by valence issues, they, they could mean that the structure is undisturbed, but actually the prospects for the parties are transformed. And that therefore the argument that Labour has particularly to win back Leave voters is not necessarily correct. Labour can win with the existing Brexit structure, so long as people think that the current government is screwed up. And, and just, uh, James, uh, I was, you know, James and Will, both of you. James, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, I was just going to, I just ag agree with that and say that um, I think, you know, perception of leaders is also crucial for that. And I think what's going to be really interesting about whether Labour can make inroads with those Leave voters is, uh, is, is actually what, prior what priority those voters are putting on leadership. Because the thing that really struck me in the December 19 election was those Red Wall voters, they loved Boris. Like, they loved him. They called him one of them. Um, you know, they said he was a common man. Um, and uh, I'll let people judge uh, for themselves on that. But, you know, they really liked Boris Johnson. And they were looking, and that, a lot of that was because what they were really looking for was authenticity and someone who says what they meant and someone who um, you know, was strong or stood up for their own views. Now, what's going to be really interesting is whether we actually see a change now in what people are looking for from their leaders. And if coronavirus means that we see competence being more important again, then that's going to be a natural benefit to Keir Starmer. So the really, it's a really big question over the coming years. If things do tack away from what people are looking for from leaders, from authenticity to competence to management, that's probably going to benefit his more than Boris Johnson. And, and without without wanting to, to repeat what, what the other speakers have said, I think it's really important to reiterate, reiterate a few things, actually. And I think that point that Paula was making, that the, you know, even if Brexit goes away and is resolved, that the underlying value divides uh, in public opinion are still going to be there. And actually, the elite queues will still be really important. Uh, and the, the point John was making about, I think, I think this applies especially to electoral geography, that a lot of the trends that we saw, the kind of the Conservatives have the breakthrough in terms of the Red Wall in 2019 have been there got underway for 30, 40 years. And, and, that, and, the, and, the, and, and what John was talking about, the kind of the, almost the tide of leaders have concealed them, that actually some of the kind of the biggest kind of breakdowns in the association between, um, for example, education and, and conservative vote occurred under Tony Blair. And it's just because it was such a large majority that those kind of those changing patterns 
shifted. Uh, and the thing I would just add to what James was saying, I, I think it's really important around competence and, and more broadly is, issue, is this issue that all leaders experience what we call kind of in, in the political science trade, the cost of governing. That essentially there is that kind of that um, um, kind of gradual um, uh, seeping away of evaluations of competence as people are in power for an extended period, which is why in some ways parties change leaders uh, at various kind of convenient moments to them. Um, and so I think that is the really huge challenge that the Conservative government will face over the period of the rest of the Parliament is actually maintaining its reputation uh, as being competent to handle the um, core uh, issues of the day. And I think actually we're really only at the start of the kind of COVID crisis that as a kind of as a as an economic as a, as a public health crisis, and we're going to shift increasingly towards COVID as an economic crisis and the kind of a crisis of how we live. And so I think that's going to be a really crucial um, uh, kind of line of conf conflict going forward. Thank you. I'm going to try and not take all of you for everything going forward, just because we've got so many questions. Uh, but the next two on the list, actually, from Sharon Lander and Alex Braley are sort of uh, linked. Well, I'm going to try and link them in the sense that what Sharon's asking is whether uh, the prospect of a sort of post-COVID recession is changing people's attitudes towards Brexit, that might be towards transition, which I know you've written on, John, or towards Brexit more generally. Is there a COVID impact on public opinion? And, and is there in public opinion a perceptible, any data about trading off economic loss for sovereignty? And has that data changed at all as a result of COVID? I don't know if any of you they're not very straightforward questions, I know, which I imagine is why none of you has unmuted yourself immediately. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try a bit. I mean, very briefly, um, I think the crucial thing to realise is that for Remain voters, the economic issues are crucial. And for Leave voters, they matter much less so far as Brexit is concerned. So voters don't necessarily see the trade-off, uh, rather they have different things uh, that they uh, want uh, to focus on. Uh, so far as the impact of coronavirus on um, attitudes towards Brexit are concerned, well, I've, I've already shown you the, the recent numbers. Now, um, the point is that um, there's been a bit of a narrowing. It's, it, I, I can point you, I, I can point, I can divide the um, uh, post Brexit day polls into pre lockdown and post lockdown. And at the moment, at least, given how few there are, I'm certainly it's difficult to argue that coronavirus has had any major impact on, on attitudes towards Brexit. Uh, on the issue of extending the transition to coronavirus, here I disagree somewhat with James. At least all the published polling I have seen had a plurality, even if you ask people, by the way, do you realise that this amazing public health crisis and both Michel Barnier and David Frost have been ill, do you think we should extend Brexit? Are you using a wording that kind of encourage people? Um, even with those polls, you've got a plurality, although sometimes only a narrow plurality of Leave voters saying, no, don't extend. Once you just ask people without um, mentioning coronavirus, should we extend or not? Uh, the answer seems to be leave voters, leave voters say no, remain voters say not, and the remain leave divide is there over the transition issue. It's just replicated. James, actually, I'm not going to give you a right of reply. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, this is from uh, Matt Bevington, who wants to know, is there any kind of correlation between income and attitude towards Brexit that you can see ongoing in the data? Go on, I'll have a go. <laughs> Is that no one else? You just dismiss Matt's question quite easily if you want. If you'd rather. Well, go. I because because I am a sociologist and not a pure political scientist, I am quite interested in how those value scales have their roots in social structure. So I have done quite a lot of work with demographics predicting the value scales, not particularly attitudes to Brexit, but I can talk about it in terms of the value scales. Mm -hmm. And income is a strong predictor of left-right attitudes. It is virtually uncorrelated with liberal authoritarian attitudes once you control for education. So I would put it really simply, education drives that um, liberal authoritarian dimension, income and wealth drives the left-right dimension, and it's the clash of those two things that you have to understand in terms of working out what people think about Brexit. Wonderful, excellent nodding all around, which means I'm not <laughs> gonna go to anyone else. 
Uh, this is, I suppose, I'll give this to you, Will, and you can, you can, I suppose, question the premise of the question if you want. It's one that came in earlier from Geoffrey Thomas, which is, can trust in government be restored? I mean, all sorts of things bundled up in that, which is A, have we completely lost trust in government? But B, what factors determine how much trust we have in government? Well, I mean, I think I think the first um, uh, thing to say is that the evidence we've seen in the last year is that uh, actually the Johnson government was able to rebuild trust uh, in uh, using the, the measure of, kind of trust in MPs, but trust in government um, by delivering Brexit. And I think actually, if you uh, if uh, you know the focus group. Uh, kind of evidence that we have suggests that it really matters to people that politicians deliver on their promises and I think that was why delivering on Brexit was so crucial for uh, for, for the election and so I think um, you know at a, at a base level I think Brexit gives us an indication of how um, delivering really matters for voters there is a question I think beyond this that um, the, the government delivering on, on Brexit has only put us back to the level around where we were, where we started. And so there, I think there is a much more fundamental question, which is about um, why um, are there such high levels of um, distrust in politics in liberal democracies across the world, actually. It's not just an issue facing uh, the UK. And actually one of the, the issues that we've been looking at on our, on our research project is actually in, in certain more authoritarian countries um, with a much, um, uh, 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 less, less free freedom and civil liberties, there are much higher levels of trust in government. And so there is a little bit of a puzzle about why in certain liberal democracies mm -hmm. we have very low levels of trust. And there are, there are a group of countries, um, of, of the liberal democratic countries, especially in uh, the Nordic countries, where there are high levels of trust. And so I think um, uh, as we look to that, I think um, uh, delivering uh, beyond that on social, the kind of social economic settlement, I think in, for British government is going to be really important in terms of levelling up, um, but also rebuilding trust among Remainers. I think that is almost in some ways the next challenge. I, I know it's it, it, the, this it kind of prompted me a little bit on the culture war. A kind of culture war is a very tempting uh, road to, to, to walk if you're interested in kind of wedge politics. But I think if we're interested in rebuilding trust in politics, cultural politics, such as we call it now, everything, everything that seems to be kind of aimed at some sort of uh, political polarization um, is not necessarily the road to go. And so I think that is, um, you know, James talked about actually this issue of whether voters really are looking for polarization and, and kind of cultural politics they're actually just looking to get some of these things off the off the table i think rebuilding political trust um, will not be helped by a politics that is about focusing on um very kind of um kind of uh divisive issues that um uh, activate the extremes on, on both sides of the political spectrum just one for James and John, and James, if you've got something to add to what Will said, you can add it for this, which is from Bob Hawk, not Bob Hawks, Bob Hawkins, apologies, uh, which is, what does the polling tell us, if anything, about the sort of Brexit that people want? Is, are there numbers on this? John, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I, I, t I take that, I mean, uh, I take that to be in part, um, you know, also a link to transition. We, we had quite a lot of evidence on this during the course um, of the whole Brexit row. And base, and I mean, if we now take here the, the crucial thing, I mean, the first answer to your question is that most Remain voters don't want Brexit at all. And that's still the case, okay? The crucial question therefore is what, what, do Lee, what did Lee voters want? Um, before Boris Johnson came up with his version of the deal, uh, those polls that were giving people various options, around a half of Leave voters were saying, let's just get out, get out without a deal. Um, and that was the single most popular option amongst Leave voters. Once Boris Johnson uh, came up with his retweet uh, version of the deal and uh, uh, came, came back with that, then a plurality of uh, Leave voters were in favour of the agreement that he got. Um, since then, polling thin, but there is still probably around a third of Leave voters who are just, who, who, who do think we should just get out at the end of December if necessary. Otherwise, beyond that, I mean, I do have another project in which we've got into much more detail about people's attitudes towards post-Brexit public policy. Broad headline is that, uh, and to underline something that James was saying, 
is that we do want to end freedom of movement and that's why we won't be inside the single market. On the other hand, it's far from clear that we want Singapore upon terms um, and that even leave voters, for example, uh, are willing to accept things like um, uh, keeping the rules on the cost of um, data and phone calls when you're in the European Union, um, keeping the bathing rules of the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. So once we get to the area of regulation as opposed to immigration, it's less obviously divided between the two sides. And I have a, some uh, question marks, uh, therefore, that insofar this seems to be a government that's more concerned about regulation than immigration that it's not necessarily delivering the kind of Brexit that Leave voters were necessarily anticipating. Yeah, I'll just, just come in on that, Anand, if I can. Um, <laughs> on uh, the perceptions of, of, of what people want, I mean, I, I, what John references there about how important Boris getting that deal uh, was, you know, shows that, you know, leaders can lead this a bit. Um, you know, opinion can be led on this. And actually, you know, the fact that Boris Johnson is on Brexit pretty strongly trusted by Leave voters. Um, the fact that people feel like his deal uh, broadly, uh, you know, feel like his deal respected uh, the result of the referendum. He's got a license on this um, and he you know, is able to lead voters a little bit more easily. Whereas under Theresa May, that come, um, we always really struggled on that because people, because Theresa May voted Remain, we never had that benefit of the doubt. And actually, you know, therefore, voters as always assumed uh, her Brexit was a little bit softer, um, perhaps, than it, than it was. So there's definitely that ability to lead there. Apart from, I think, on, on free movement, and I think more so than free movement, um, a, you know, an immigration system um, that's based on skills and, the, um, and then potentially even reduction in immigration as well. I think you know, that is something that does come through very clearly um, in, in all of this research. Um, and, uh, and, and I would completely agree with what, what Don says. You know, voters would probably be persuaded in most any direction of regulation. James. That voters could be persuaded in any direction on regulation um, as long as you don't have you know, Nigel Farage came, campaigning against it. But on immigration, there's much less wriggle room for the government. Brilliant. Paula, one for you here from some bloke called Matthew Goodwin, who says, isn't this debate about social authoritarianism really about social conservatism? And so isn't using this authoritarianism tag profoundly and grossly misleading? I paraphrase his question, as I feel I have the right to do. But that's what he's basically <laughs> asking. So to say, someone always shouts at me. Um, but he says I'm shouting and he just puts it in inverted commas. So it's a sort of virtual There's capitals there. We'll take it and not shout him. Um, I think about and wrestle with this question probably every single day. And I switch around backwards and forwards as to how to label these, this scale. And each of the ways of doing it has its own difficulty. If I'm talking to an audience that has lots of political psychologists in it, then authoritarianism is a terrible label because it gives off a certain a certain set of measures, which is not what I mean. Um, and I get that. And if I talk to audiences that are less familiar with the terminology and I use social conservative, then people assume that it's about immigration and gay marriage and things that don't actually get measured in the scale. I have not got a solution. <laughs> I am trying to write a piece about a more sociological understanding of authoritarianism um, and I keep playing with different terms. I've tried traditionalism, but I don't think that quite captures it. Um, I've tried security, but that doesn't quite capture it either. But I don't know, maybe, I think maybe security works as a kind of economic um, and non-economic security, but you can't call it economic and social security because that doesn't work as a term. So if anybody in the participants has a good response to this, I would love to hear it. Please, please email me or tweet me if you have a really good response to what we should put on the other end of that scale. But Paula, isn't this in some ways, this kind of reflects in the debate in the academic literature about the whole, the, the second dimension of politics, right? That is an ongoing debate outside Britain, actually, about, you know, using language like cosmopolitan, um, you know, kind of uh, where, where the green attitudes are on this dimension. I think it's, uh, it's a really fundamental 
issue that and of course you know the history of these items is fully to do with their kind of the they were developed in a period where that was the language on you know, I remember that they appeared a little bit better, better than me. And so I think, you know, it's obviously important that we're very careful with language, but that's also true of culture war um, language, you know, terms like woke, I think uh, we can get, we can get them bad, we can band those around far too lazily in our analysis. And I think we need to be really careful when we're talking about value divides. Um, um, so I think, I think, but, but that kind of that issue about it, it's actually beyond that fascinating why the language of left right isn't problematic in terms of the, the labels that we attach but the value dimensions and the, the language we use does seem to invoke much more in terms of uh, positive and negative responses brilliant thank you john i think i'm going to give this one to you it's from robin phelps uh i mean the question is phrased in a certain way how much is brexit responsible for strong polling for scottish independence but you get the gist it's about yeah, uh, I sh short answer, um, significantly so. So um, we are now getting, I mean, the, 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 the okay, various points. The, the, the immediate, I mean, if you ironically go back to the position in 2014 when there was a Scottish independence referendum, one of the ironies you will discover is that there is no relationship at all between whether you voted yes or no to independence and your attitudes towards the European Union. So the politicians spend, it, spend hours arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland would or could or could not be a continuing member of the European Union. And they might as well have saved their breath because it did not have any discernible impact on people's view. Um, however, once you uh, get uh, to um, the EU referendum, after the EU referendum, you begin to see a relationship emerge between how people uh, uh, voted in the Brexit referendum and their current views on independence. Now, for quite a while, the net effect of that was zero. In other words, you know, there were between a quarter and a third of yes voters who voted leave, and some of them went off in favour of no. Now that the United Kingdom had the sense to leave the European Union, and given the SNP's perspective for independence is, in, is independence inside the EU, some of them switched towards no. But equally, there were some people who were sufficiently upset about Scotland being taken out of the European Union that they switched from no to yes. For a long time, the net effect was, was zero. But from the spring of last year, it began to become clear that that was no longer the case and that the number of voters switching from no to yes was outnumbering the people who were switching from yes to no. And that the, all of the, and by this point we were beginning to, rather than support for yes and no still being at basically the 45-55 of September 2014, it was now around 48-52. Um, and all of the increase occurred amongst Remain voters and since then, if you now take the polls that have been done in the last few months, not very many of them again, it's coronavirus, but we're now looking at an average, I think it's yes, 51, no, 49. This is probably the first period in Scottish polling history and where one could say, at least at minimum, a half of Scotland wishes to leave the union. And, there, and it's very clear that this is being driven by the views of Remain voters. So certainly, you know, whatever your views, if you are a unionist, you have to understand that so far at least, the pursuit of Brexit has served to undermine popular support for Scotland men inside uh, the UK, such that the outcome of a referendum is, is highly uncertain and probably for the first time ever, the SNP might be thought to have a realistic chance of winning. That said, of course, coronavirus brings in its own dynamic and its own potential consequences. But you know, you won't surprise me to tell you is that when you start asking people, has coronavirus make a difference to your view? Those people who are yes voters say, yes, it's confirmed me in my views that we should get out of the UK. And those who are on the other side of the argument uh, uh, come up with the opposite point of view. And of course, what one certainly has to be brought, brought to mind, valence issue as it is, whereas Boris Johnson's uh, personal popularity and that of his party has taken a severe tumble uh, since basically the middle of May. Uh, the Scottish government, even though it's faced many of the same issues 
and has made many of the same mistakes, has so far emerged as uh, people still having trust in. And I think in part that's just to do with tone, as indeed um, I heard uh, uh, um, Nick, uh, uh, Nick Robertson this morning on Today programme ask Brandon Lewis, might it not be in your interest to occasionally admit that you've got it wrong? And answer came there, none. Nicola Sturgeon has been much more direct, much more upfront about difficult decisions that she's had to make. And I think, and also frankly, has also been much more understanding that what people want to get out of, what the bit of lockdown they don't like is the lack of social contact. It's not the fact that they can't get back to work. So she has been pursuing a tougher lockdown, trying to get rid of the virus, focusing much more on the social side, being more up, much more upfront, and that so far at least has been more successful than the UK government's position, which has been, uh, don't admit any mistakes, tell everybody it's going brilliantly and to focus on economic regeneration. Now we'll wait and see how this plays out, but certainly so far, at least so far as the dynamics is concerned, um, coronavirus has not done the SNP um, uh, much harm at all. James, I'm going to try and get another couple of questions in. We've got five minutes, but James, I'm going to give this one to you. It's one that came in earlier. I mean, the specific question is about uh, voters in red wall seats and whether or not they're in favour of extending transition. But there was some polling done for one of the anti-Brexit campaign groups recently, I think might have been best for Britain about the red wall seats. It was interesting. But do you have any insights into whether people in these red wall seats have specific views as in different to the rest of the country uh, and what their views might be on Brexit, whether it's on the extension or what sort of Brexit we might end up with. Yeah, I mean, it, it overlaps. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll turn my video off just in case my uh, <laughs> turn robotic again. Um, uh, I think it takes what John was saying that, you know, these voters will be you know, much more likely to be leave voters. Um, so therefore, they will have uh, more sort of um, uh, sort of slightly stronger, more sort of obviously pro leave views. I mean, the interesting thing that I've picked up on in focus groups, and I think there were some focus groups you know, for the a terrible slight from a pollster, but I can't remember who who did them, but they were written up uh, in in the Times, and I'll dig that afterwards. Um, oh, James, you're you're going robotic again. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, I'll slow down. I think whenever um, I interrupt you, it, it fixes it, which is great for me. That is bizarre. <laughs> um, just, just to say, really, that um, you know, I, I do think that one risk on uh, not extending and one risk on existential face-off with the EU, uh, potentially with no agreement, is that a lot of voters, uh, when I've discussed it in focus groups, and it's been discussed in others, um, they sort of can't quite believe that Brexit is being talked about because they think all of the focus should be on the pandemic um, and uh, it always creates laughter. We just have a quick um, pause, James, just to see if it'll sort itself out. I was sort of losing you. Sorry, they, they're never going to get across this. They can't believe <laughs> Brexit is being spoken about. Yeah, they uh, just to finish, I mean, they basically can't believe it's being spoken about in the context of a pandemic. Um, so that level of uh, uh, you know disbelief, um, you know, may well not help a government that wants to uh, you know have the existential face of the EU. I think that applies in the red wall as well as other places. Can I just follow up on that, Alan, a bit from the focus groups oh, that, we, that we've been doing, which is uh, seeing very similar things. Uh, the first point, actually, that John was saying about admitting when you're wrong. I mean, one of the themes that we've been asking. Um, leavers and remainers about, you know, rebuilding political trust. And one of the things we you ask them, you know, well, what can politicians do is admit when you're wrong, um, you know, admit, you know, deliver, but also admit when you're wrong. And the other, the, our other finding from from the, talking to leavers is that um, they're they're relatively phlegmatic about questions of ex extension. And I think the other really important warning sign, I think, for the government in terms of what they're saying is that actually voters, leavers and remainers, are both very wary and conscious of the possible conflation of the effects of a no deal Brexit and COVID and the idea that you might be able to kind of just um, ship uh, secretly uh, a no deal Brexit quietly and a no deal Brexit through uh, and say well we know go, we're going through this kind of this massive public health and economic crisis it's nothing to do with Brexit I think would be uh, potentially naive that the voters are actually 
very aware of the challenges the government faces and they've actually given them you know they in some ways although they're quite um critical of handling of the crisis they still express relatively high levels of implicit trust they still trust the government to do the right thing and to look out for them and so i think that those dynamics for the next six months are actually far more um, potentially volatile and complicated than are currently being presented and voters are actually very making very sophisticated evaluations of what's going on because they know we're in the middle of a, a huge crisis and they know the government's making really tricky decisions so i mean let me let me push you on this and any of you can come in we've got about a minute left but it's the question from jeffrey thomas which is so if we leave with or without a deal at the end of the year and it leads to disruption and there seems to be some sort of Im economic impact so what i mean what does what, what does that mean we're a long way from an election uh is 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 this is, is that important or is the government just calculating that we'll get it out of the way now and by the time we come to have a, another election it won't matter anymore any of you want to speculate well, I mean, I think it is really speculation, but I think the, the, the sorts of questions you might ask will be how severe is the disruption? Um, how are the government able to frame whatever disruption from a no deal, um, look, uh, 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 how, they frame, how they frame that disruption um, and how fleeting is it? I think, you know, the question about will it matter for the next election will be, um, is it fundamental? Uh, does it kind of lead to kind of lasting economic impact or is it a matter of a short um, um, short period of disruption on top of what we've gone through with COVID and by the time of the next election people are looking towards new priorities and I think those are things we really can't know until we go through that process but it is a very risky strategy for any political party to kind of pursue. Brilliant. Does yeah. anyone else want to come in yeah. on that? Just, just very quickly on that, um, I think you know I, I know what some of these people mean when they say well it doesn't matter if we are you know, only two points behind because you know, the election is is miles off. But there is an election next year in Scotland, as John said, where Brexit actually does have an impact on views towards independence. And I think this is the major, you know, slightly unspoken thing, which really can create a huge impact, uh, you know, in the coming months. And years of conservative, and as John said, those numbers are not going in the right direction. And if the SNP get a majority in that election, where the Conservatives have the best bet at getting seats, more so than Labour, then that's going to greatly increase the chances of independence. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, unless you desperately want to come in on this, Paula, uh, it remains for me simply to thank all of you. We seem to have lost John. I've lost him from my screen. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to do this and to uh, speak to our audience. Thank you to our audience for attending, for all your questions. I'm very, very sorry. Perhaps predictably, we only got through uh, a small number of them. Uh, and look out for another event. Our next schedule, well, not scheduled as yet, event is going to be on devolution. And we'll be getting a date for that fixed and we're getting it advertised fairly soon. In the meantime, you may now go and have some lunch. Uh, thank you to everyone. Keep well, and we hope that we will be seeing you in person again in the not too distant future. Thanks ever so much, all. Bye bye. Thanks.